thank you, Kirsten, and thanks to the botanist uh, for putting up with me. I'm a bird researcher, and I'm talking about pollinators to botanists, so you'll forgive me if I mispronounce any plant names, and I, I hope that you point out anything that I mess up <laughs> and ask questions about at the end. Okay. Let's see if I can this quicker. Yeah, so um, as Kirsten said, we're doing some research on bumblebees in Plumas National Forest in riparian and meadow habitat um, in the Montane system. Uh, I work for the Institute for Bird Populations, and this was in collaboration with uh, the National Forest, and primarily, the primary contact on that was Matthew Johnson. And any bee illustrations you see here was, were done by my very talented colleague, Lauren Helton. And here's a nice meadow shot, really super diverse meadow shot to start us off. You know, bumblebees really like those. <laughs> okay, uh, so just to give a little introduction about bumblebees, since I am talking to botanists, but I'm sure many of you folks already know, bumblebee species are in decline throughout North America. Many of them are. Um, and that's due to a variety of factors, climate change, habitat loss, uh, parasite transfer from other insect species, um, competition and you know a, a lot of other factors as well, including phenological phenological shifts of plants and also phenological shifts of insects and maybe some sort of mismatch between those two. So knowing all this information, it's probably beneficial to understand what plant species, bumblebee species, actually prefer over others. So that maybe if we're looking to enhance habitat we can see what those species are outplanted in species. Okay, so the project motivation. This is really motivated by the western bumblebee, since on a lot of regional forests uh, in the Sierra, they're interested in knowing where western bumblebees are on their forests, and along with that, we wanted to collect all bumblebee data to understand where bumblebees were on the forest, how many there were, uh, presence, absence, relative abundance, and the habitat requirements for those species. There's general habitat requirements, for instance, how much shrub, how much canopy cover, and then more specialized things such as what plant species are they selecting for in these plots. So a little bit of research background. Again, I work for a bird resource organization, so one of the first things that we tackled on the plumas was looking at what birds and bumblebees use as far as habitat. And one of the findings that we came up with was that, unsurprisingly, bumblebees really like a lot of floral diversity and plot. Um, but that led us to the question of what specific species are bumblebees going for in these plots? So for instance, you know, are, are they going for cercium? Are they going for something else except for a pen stem? And, and maybe we can use this information, again, to enhance the habitat for pollinators and maybe for other species as well. So our research objectives were pretty simple. Uh, what plants do bumblebees like? So we got some bumblebee love going on up there on the slide. Uh, does plant selection change annually? So we did this, we did these bumblebee surveys for two years in 2015 and 2016 in the Plymouth. And our plants our plant species selected uh, for by multiple bumblebees, bumblebee species. So is there some sort of holy grail plant species that we can put out there and all bumblebees like it? Well, the spoiler alert, it, there isn't one, but maybe there will, maybe we'll find one eventually. Uh, so our study area, like I said, was on Plumas National Forest. It was primarily within the Moonlight Fire footprint. We had a lot of sampling plots, 413. About half of them were along riparian reaches and half were in meadow areas. And we used a grid sampling scheme, just to randomize the, the plots along these reaches and within meadows. So a big area, about 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers. So now we get some nice bumblebee photos, or at least one, um, and a big loop and field photo, of course, that's beautiful. Uh, so our bumblebees were live captured and live released. So a lot of insect surveys, what happens is you'll go out and collect the insects or you'll collect them in a pan trap and they'll be dead and then you put them into your collection and identify them afterwards. Uh, but with bumblebees, going back to that introductory slide where we saw that bumblebees are declining, we thought it might be helpful to release the bumblebee alive in the plot so they could go back to pollinating plants. Uh, so we took these bumblebees, we went out to a 20 meter radius plot, searched for bumblebees for about four, 16 minutes, 
netted them, put them in these things that look like little clear film canisters, chilled them down inside of a cooler, uh, then they get really slow, can't move around as quickly, can't sting you, and then you can identify them and photograph them for later in case we had some sort of, um, in, in case we couldn't really identify the species exactly at that point, we could refer it to an expert and they could help us. And then, like I said, we released them alive at the plot. Okay, so for our vegetation methods, when we were out at these plots surveying, oh, I should also say this, uh, our sampling took place from late May until uh, mid-August. So our sampling methods, we went out and identified the top five blooming plants each time we did the survey. So that previous presentation was really helpful talking about availability of plants. So one thing to understand, to figure out what, what plants bumblebees are selecting for, you have to understand the availability of the plants on the landscape. Essentially, what we did was we identified the top five plant species, and this is just an example with big leaf lupin. So for instance, if at 50 of our plot surveys, we detected big leaf lupin, and we did 1,500 plot surveys, the proportion of plots was 0.03, so about 3% of plots had big leaf lupin. And for bumblebee usage, it's similar. So the number of times we capture a particular bumblebee species on a plant divided by the total number of captures of that bumblebee species on any flowering plant. And then we get another proportion. So this is about 10% of captures was on big leaf lupin. And essentially, we use some statistical tests, chi-squared tests, and broad disease statistic to look for significant differences um, in the selection or avoidance of different plant species. So in this instance, uh, the use was a lot greater than the availability, and we had a lot of bumblebee love for that particular plant species. So on to the results. We had we captured 13 bumblebee species across both years. A lot of captures, about 4,800 uh, across both of those years. 1,200, about 1,215, 3,600 in 2016. Um, a, a really surprising thing was we had 12 times as many Bombus vasicinskii that we captured in 2016 versus 2015. Um, we can talk about that a little bit later, maybe at the end of this presentation. And this is just a plot of the phenology of these five bumblebee species that we decided to analyze uh, through time. So going from left to right on the x-axis is the season, seasonality, and then you can see many of the species peak in late July, and we have one of these species, Melana pigus, peaks earlier in the season, and we'll see that a little bit later in uh, the plant selection part. So 105 plant species or complexes were ever touched by a bumblebee species, which is a pretty good amount, um, but out of those, only 14 were significantly selected for. You know, this act, part of this comes down to you only get a certain number of observations of a bumblebee using a plant. Um, so those plants that are a little bit more available on the landscape and more common might be a little bit more likely to be significantly selected for under the statistics that we use. So I still think those 105 species are important to bumblebees, and uh, these might be just a little bit more important than those other ones. But diversity is by far paramount over saying whether this is a bumblebee species or not, in my opinion. And just these plots to show that phenology was similar between years for plants and uh, bumblebees. So again, going from left to right, that's the abundance of a plant species or a bumblebee species through time. And then uh, the left column is 2015, the right column is 2016. And since that was small, I'll just zoom in a little bit. This takeaway from this slide is that bumblebees tended to track the flowering period of different plant species that they selected for. So that, that previous slide was looking at the 12 plant species that they significantly selected for um, at the plots. And it makes makes sense, right, if they, if they like this species that they will tend to use it more when it's more available on, on the landscape. And this is a, a little bit more complicated plot. Essentially, if the dot is on the left side of this black line, that means they were avoiding the plants and if it's on the right side, they were selecting for the plant. So this is sort of, this slide is trying to answer the question of, is there, is there some holy grail plant species that all of these bumblebee species like? Um, Agastache cirrusifolia was maybe the one, if you want to call it the holy grail species, that's the one that three out of five of the species, these species that we considered 
uh, used the most. The rest had, at, at most, two bumblebee species that were using it, using that plant species significantly uh, more than it was available on the landscape. Uh, this is just another, this is answering the question about annual selection. So we only had enough availability information, uh, availability and capture information to compare the usage between 2015 and usage and availability between 2015 and 2016. I know this looks really complicated, these arrows are moving around and everything. Essentially the dot is the use and availability. So use, use is on the uh, y-axis and availability is on the x-axis. And then the arrow is pointing to, so the dot is for 2015, the use availability, and then the arrow is pointing to 2016. So essentially how use and availability changed their time. And what we saw for the Vaz, Vaz Asenskii, the most abundant bumblebee species, was that yeah, we saw some wiggling around, but we didn't really see any movement from selected for to uh, selected against. So it, it makes sense to think that these plant selection, the selection for these plant species stays relatively con constant, at least between these two years that we went out and sampled. So here's the big finale plot, I guess. I'm gonna use a lightsaber here. This is the laser pointer. Okay, so, um, so this center area here is essentially showing the phenology of these plants. So the darker the square, the more abundant that plant was on, on the landscape. And the top, these top lines, essentially the fat of the line is the more abundant that bumblebee species was through time. So when you go across here, this is increasing through season. And then the size of these dots is how, how much the plant species was selected for by that bumblebee species. So you can kind of see, one of the patterns that I take away from this is that having plant species that have staggered blooming periods through time is really important for bumblebee species, right? I'm sure all you folks could have already told me that one. <laughs> and uh, another one is that depending on the phenology, you'll see a stronger selection for those plant species that sort of flower at the same time that the bumblebee species becomes most abundant, which again, isn't that surprising. Um, but the takeaway from this is that we at least have 12, 12 plant species now that we can give to Plumas National Forest and say, hey, maybe you could enhance um, pollinator habitat by planting some of these species if you, if you have a, if you have a plot that, if you have a plot that doesn't have very many bumblebee species and you're looking to enhance that for bumblebee species. Let's see, I think I covered most of these. Yeah, so diversity of plants is important and staggered bloom periods is very important for bumblebees. As you might suspect, you know, you have consistent availability of resources for them to feed on. Uh, selection seems stable interannually. And like I said, maybe you could enhance habitat by planting some of these, what we identified as bumblebee, quote unquote, bumblebee plant species. Oh, and another thing to consider is compare your use to availability instead of just doing use only things. Instead of just doing use only. So a lot of studies, like for instance, that those bipartite, bipartite plots that uh, the previous speaker showed was mainly showing the, the usage of these plants and not comparing it to availability. So when you add in the availability component, it's, it's more along the lines of what do they like the most out of what's available out there, right? Instead of just what's most abundant. And that might seem like it's the most important to bumblebees when in fact it may not be um, the most selected for. So I want to thank all of the field crew, uh, Plumas National Forest, Robin Thorpe for helping with uh, entomology collection and identification, Gretchen Laboon from San Francisco State for helping us set up the study design, and all the IVP staff. Thank you very much.